It's episode 598 of the Locked on Texas Rangers podcast. On today's show, I'm going to talk about Marcus Simeon. It's time. I'm worried. I'm very deeply concerned. But there's also a little bit of reason for optimism. All that and more on this episode of Locked on Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are Locked On the Texas Rangers. I'm your host, Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010 in year four hosting this podcast. It's Friday, May 20th. Your Rangers are 17 and 20, sitting still pretty at third place in the American League West. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. You can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers. And the best way to help the show is to subscribe on YouTube and comment anything below. Comment Astro Stink. Comment I'm worried about Marcus Simeon. Comment uh, nice, nice shirt today. By the way, I'm wearing my uh, my Rice Owl shirt for Glenn Otto, who did a, a pretty solid job, did everything the Rangers could have asked for in a 5-1 to one loss to the Astros. The Rangers' winning streak is over, and they're going to have to try and start a new one this weekend, or I guess Friday night in Houston. A really solid outing from Glenn Otto, just like I said. I did have three walks, but went six innings, struck out a pair, and, you know, overall did pretty well with runners on base. He allowed seven hits and three walks, so 10 base runners in six innings, but he was able to work around that pretty well. He threw 96 pitches in this one to get it to the bullpen, and the bullpen did not do its job. Josh Spores did not look good in this one. He did not have command of pretty much anything. He walked three in an inning and a third. Everything kind of got out of hand for him. It was a close game until that eighth inning where he just was not able to get out of it. Matt Moore came in to try and help the situation, but he, he just wasn't enough. And, of course... Of course the Rangers lose on a Martin Maldonado 3 RBI double. Like of course they do. It's not it's not Jose Altuve who killed them with the four hit game. It wasn't Bregman or Jordan Alvarez or, you know, Kyle Tucker. Kyle Tucker did fine. He had a hit, a walk, an RBI and a run. That like it and he also stole a base. Like he was fine. Altuve also got thrown out on the bases by Eli White, who played some really great defense, had a pair of outfield assists in this game. Absolutely loved that. Um, He got Bregman out at third base. He got um, Jose Altuve out at second base. So, yeah, really nice stuff there. Um, And, yeah, yeah, just a really solid outing defensively from him. Offensively. He walked and, and scored the Rangers' first run. The Rangers were able to score in that first inning, take a one nothing lead. That was quickly gone, very quickly gone, in the bottom of the first inning where the Astros were able to score a pair and take that lead right back, and the Rangers would not score anything else for the whole rest of the day. They had base runners. They had their chances. You know, they had eight base runners in total in this one. Corey Seager was the one to knock in Eli White from second base. A nice opposite field single. Uh, Nice to see him hitting on the road because he has not done super well on the road. But yeah, not a great outing from Matt Moore, who did come in and did get a pair of strikeouts, but he also allowed that double to score the three runs. And uh, Josh Spores was was just not able to get out of that inning. And uh, yeah, the Rangers were were kind of close in that one, but it it didn't matter because the Astros pitching was just so good in this one. Just so stinking good in this game, and especially, especially the bullpen. The bullpen was just locked down. These two relievers in Hector Neris and Ryan Presley were both just dominated Rangers hitters. Three up, three down, three strikeouts, the both of them. And another solid performance for from Rivaldez, who has a 268 ERA on the season. The Rangers were able to get on a little bit against him, but he struck out seven in seven innings, was able to go pretty deep into this game, and the Rangers just were not able to get to him. And it was it was just not a great outing for the Rangers. The Astros really needed this. They just came off losing a series to the Boston Red Sox. The Rangers know a thing about that because they did that literally right before the Astros did. But I thought they would have some momentum coming off of that sweep. I thought they would feel a little bit better you know, do a little bit more in this one. Oh, by the way, you know who's back? Mitch Garver is back in DHing probably until about, about, I don't know, a month or so. 
maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe it's, you know, early July that he starts catching again, but he's going to be not in the field for a while, but the Rangers need that bat in there. Solid outing for him today. Did strike out, but also got on base with a walk. And the Rangers optioned Nick Solak, which felt like the obvious move because he is just not done well. He's not hitting lefties well. He's not playing good defense. He's not really contributing at the big league level. And it might be about the end of his tenure here with the Rangers, at least at the major league level for a while, because, you know, you got to earn your spot. And if you can't do the one thing that you're there to do, which is platoon in left field and hit against lefties, then you're not going to provide a lot of value, especially since the Rangers can just stick Eli White out there and he provides incredible defensive value, like we saw with the two outfields just today, plus his ridiculous speed, his extremely aggressive base running, and, uh, you know, just the other things that he does well, which is just get on base against righties and lefties at a much higher clip than Nick Solak is doing this season. But it was good to see him out there. A nice performance for Glenn Otto, who is a Houston native and, uh, yeah, a Rice Owl. So really very Houston, but also does not like Houston now, uh, at least the Astros, which he said after his big league debut, which I believe was against the Astros, where he dominated them. and said, yeah, no, I grew up cheering for him. Now I hate him because I'm on the Rangers. So it's a great attitude to have and a great performance out of him. Uh, decent showing by Marcus Simeon, who was pretty much the only one who hit the ball well. He had his eighth double of the season, which does lead the Texas Rangers. Uh, a nice hit off of Fromber Valdez on a changeup low and away that he was able to scorch for a double. Also had his third stolen base of the season. He stole third base off of Fromber Valdez and Martin Maldonado, which was nice. Also, by the way, Josh Boards had a, a throwing error on the pickoff move as well. So yeah, uh, really not a great outing for him. Um, Matt Moore not being able to come in and clean up that mess it was a little frustrating, but you know, it happens. He didn't load the bases with a bunch of walks and base runners. Uh, that was Josh Spores is doing. But the Rangers are back at it on Friday night. They've got a pretty solid matchup. I believe it's Martin Perez versus Justin Verlander, if my memory is correct. No, it's Martin Perez versus Christian Javier. And then Saturday is the John Gray versus Justin Verlander matchup. But coming up, I'm going to talk about Marcus Simeon, why I'm worried about him, and why there is some reason for optimism. But first, I want to tell y'all about Built Bar. There is a new flavor, or a restocked flavor, I should say. It's called the Brownie Batter Puffs. They are fantastic. You know, I love brownies, but what do I love more? Brownie batter. Sometimes I eat half the batter just while I'm making the brownies. Imagine if you could lick the brownie spatula clean and get some protein in. Yeah, you're in luck because Built has a new creation. This one is better than ever. The Brownie Batter Puff. You heard me right. This puff taste takes protein bars to a whole new level, and they're available right now at Built.com. They are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides like, a whole, whole bunch of health benefits. They're also covered in 100%. Real chocolate means you can, uh, with Built, you can eat healthy and actually taste something good while you're doing it. Go to Built.com, get Brownie Batter Puffs now. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCK15 to get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen of the day. For your second listen of the day, check out the Locked On Now podcast with recaps from all MLB games from your different hosts across the network. It's taking you through the season like no other network, and it's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Now... I've been putting this off for a while, and I'm even putting this off now by telling you how much I'm putting it off, because this is something that I don't want to talk about, and it's been very frustrating, and it's it's just past the point where it needs to be talked about. Marcus Simeon has been bad for the Texas Rangers. He has not been providing anywhere near the value. I was almost more excited about getting Marcus Simeon than getting Corey Seager. I mean, Seager is obviously the big fish, and you know he's had a few struggles of his own as well, but... Simeon was a guy who I absolutely loved, a hugely underrated player, a guy who <clears throat> has been, you know, betting on himself, you know, every single stage of his career. Like he was not a highly touted, not a super duper highly touted prospect. I mean, he wasn't thought of that highly for the Chicago White Sox who drafted him in the sixth round and uh, traded him in a deal to Oakland um, for a pitcher who I'm trying to remember who exactly it was. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he was traded with for Jeff Samarja and Michael Yanoa. Like, 
<laughs> really, really wasn't thought of super duper. I mean, Samarja was fine and pretty decent, but like still, uh, it, it had to be frustrating for him to get traded. But he did get traded to Oakland, which was you know his his home area. He grew up in the Bay. He went to Cal. He absolutely loved it there. Um, grew up in San Francisco, born in San Francisco, grew up there, um, went to St. Mary's High School in Berkeley, California, and then went to the University of Cal Berkeley. Like he is a Bay Area kid. And, you know, he wasn't thought of very highly while he was there. He just had so many defensive boneheaded plays at shortstop. Wasn't sure if he was going to stick at shortstop, but then worked really hard with Ron Washington to become a very good defensive shortstop. Now, I don't know that he was you know, ever elite because he also had Matt Chapman next to him, which did make him a lot better. So people underrated him yet again for what he could do. Um, but he's had two of the best three seasons of his career have been in the last three seasons. Also, one of the worst ones came in 2020, which, you know, Again, I'm totally willing to write off because we all had a bad 2020. Like, nobody did well. He finished top three in MVP voting in 2019 and 2021. Wasn't even an all-star when he finished top three in MVP voting. So another, ugh, I got to bet on myself. People don't know how good I am. And then he has a terrible 2020. Gets an absolute joke of a contract extension offer from his beloved hometown A's, who, again, cheap out and lose another great player for literally nothing because they were so cheap and takes a one year bet on himself deal in Toronto where he has an absolutely unbelievable season. One of the best that any second baseman's ever had. And then he gets a seven year contract with the Rangers making an average of $25 million, which is way more than he's ever made before. And he's been terrible. He's been straight up terrible. I mean, you look at all of his advanced numbers and they're straight up bad. They're not just bad, horrific. You know, in average exit velocity, expected WOBA, expected batting average, expected slugging percentage, hard hit percentage, barrel percentage, all of those in the bottom 7% of the league. Not just terrible, extra terrible. Outs above average defensively, he has slipped well below what he was at his gold glove level last year. I think a few of these have just been some boneheaded plays that might be throwing it out of proportion a little bit, but he's in the 21st percentile, uh, which is, you know, bad bottom quarter of the league the only thing that he has done well is in strikeout percentage he's in the top quarter of baseball so he's not swinging and missing a whole bunch um or striking out a whole bunch and whiff rate he's in the 68th percentile he is chasing a little bit more than average his max exit velocity is right in the middle of the pack of all the baseball and his sprint speed is in the top eight percent of baseball so he's still running hard he's still fast he didn't just you know fall off a cliff athletically at least but the rest of his numbers are are not great. You look at his, his batting profile and some of the things that you notice that um, is that uh, his barrel rate is down 7% from last year. His hard hit rate is down 15% from last year. His walk rate is down 2%. He's swinging 8% more. He's chasing pitches out of the zone 8.4% more. And he's swinging at the first pitch 8.5% more. But he's been especially terrible at home. You want to look at his splits, and they have been... Uh, very bad at Clove Life Field. Just very, very bad. He's got a slash line of, brace yourself for this, 129, 196, and 165. That's an OPS of 360. That's not great. He's walked seven times to 11 strikeouts in 92 appearances at Clove Life Field. He obviously does not have a home run, and he has three doubles there. Um, just really, really bad numbers. And... Like I said, he's been a big bet on himself guy, and this is the first time where somebody bet on him. And it's like, all right, you're not underrated anymore. You're one of the best players in the league. You were by far the best second baseman in all of baseball last year, and you will be expected to be that and expected to take this team that has been absolutely hot dookie garbage for the last couple of years and make them not that. There are a lot of expectations riding on this guy. He is the old head, the veteran. I mean, they do have Cole Calhoun, who is, you know, was not thought of as the superstar hitter that he's turned to be in the month of May. But he is another older veteran voice. Marcus has never been the big, booming, look at me, leader kind of guy. He's been the uh, quietly watch me work watch me, you know, watch the effort that I put into every single day and model yourself after that as opposed to the, you know, throw a trash can through a window team meeting kind of guy. I mean, there's just different kinds of leaders and that's what he is. But <clears throat> your leadership is expected 
when you get that kind of a contract. And I kind of hate putting that on the guy, but that that's what it is. That's the reality of the situation. You're getting paid $25 million and you have not been good. And it has been incredibly frustrating to watch. The first couple of weeks of the season, it, his at-bats were just brutal, absolutely brutal. I thought that starting in Toronto would help because, you know, he's just coming back. He's seeing all his, his old friends, all his teammates, all the people who did believe in him and thought, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll sign you that one-year deal. And um, maybe even he could have had a little bit of a, a, a screw you. You should have given me this seven-year deal, and I would have stayed there and helped Toronto win, which... You know, they went and traded for his old buddy, Matt Chapman. Like, oh, why, why couldn't you have paid me that and traded for Matt Chapman so you could have, gosh, if, if their infield had Simeon, Chapman, and Bo Bichette and, and Vladdy at first base, that would be one of the best infields ever, offensively at least. But still, you could have had a moment of like, hey, screw you, I'm back. I am worth every bit of this deal. I am legit. Watch me absolutely crush you and make you depressed that you didn't sign me this deal. But he didn't do that, and he hasn't done that so far. Um, and it's been incredibly frustrating to watch. I do think that he will, you know, pull out of it. I don't think it's a lack of effort. It's not like a, oh, well, I got this generational money, so I'm just going to kick my freaking feet up and just chill and be terrible. That's not how these guys are wired. That is not how any professional baseball player is wired, let alone the best of the best he most certainly does have that dog in him, and I know that he is working his freaking tail off to get back to being one of the best players in baseball. I said it before on yesterday's episode that maybe going to Houston will help him you know, find his bat and hit his first home run of the season because it's been 36 games. It is not a tiny sample size anymore. 157 plate appearances where he has a slugging percentage of two. 31 and an on base of 236 his ops is below 500 that's bad that's straight up bad his batting average on balls in play is 212 which means you know the balls that he's hitting are not you know they're not hit hard they're not hit where fielders aren't they're just being hit slowly and softly at people and it has been it's it's time the rangers need more from him they absolutely have to have more from him and i think they're going to get it sometime soon um there's definitely some reasons for optimism i'm going to get into those um because you know you can bet that marcus simeon is going to do better than he has been doing but if, if you want to bet on that or just on the rangers in general our partners at bet online can be the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs and info you know, they can find the latest odds, news, sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next year's NFL futures. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. Thank you all so much for listening, making this your first listen every single day, hoping that Marcus Simeon listens and wants to prove me wrong. I am happy to be proven wrong, just like I was with Nathaniel Lowe right before his walk-off home run. Uh, Marcus, if you would like to make me look stupid, I mean, the rest of the Rangers offense made me look really stupid scoring literally one run a day after I said, the offense is fixed. Uh, if you would like to make me continue to look stupid, Marcus Simeon, there are some reasons for optimism with this guy. I mean, like him or not, which I don't know why you wouldn't like him. This is a very likable dude. If you don't like him, then it's probably just because he's not hitting baseball as well, which he probably doesn't like himself right now for that. But, you know, there are some reasons for optimism. He's got a five-game on base streak on the road, which uh, is where the Rangers are for now and for the rest of this series. He's doing much, much better on the road. Much, much better. His OPS on the road is 620 which is 260 points higher than at home. It's kind of insane. He's like the antithesis of Corey Seager. You know, Corey Seager can't hit on the road, but mashes like crazy at Globe Life Field. Seager's OPS is 506 points better at home versus on the road. So it's kind of like there's this stupid superhero in this show called Venture Brothers. The, the, these two superheroes that they're one and it, one, it's a husband and, and, and wife. The husband by day is a hawk 
and the wife by night is a bee and it's it's stupid it's very stupid basically neither of them can meet in the middle in between except for ed and clips and it's seeming like that's what it's like with this rangers middle infield seager can only hit at home simeon can only hit on the road and it would be nice to have both of them hitting both places or just you know for for Simeon, really just having him hit any place is is the place to start. And you know, with the baseballs being, you know, not as dead as they were like two weeks ago, I think that's going to help him because he has had some balls that probably should be home runs in, in other parks. Like you look at the expected numbers um, versus where he's got home runs or how many home runs he'd have in other places versus how many he'd have here. At uh, at Globe Life Field, he would have zero with all the the they do the tracking on a baseball savant of like the distance and the wall height and things like that. Um, if he played every game at Houston, he would have two home runs by now. If he played every game at Safeco or Toronto or Boston or Detroit or the Twins or the White Sox or San Diego or the Mets or the Phillies, if he played for the Cubs every single game in Wrigley, he'd have four home runs at this point. Like, he has been hitting baseballs hard, and he's riding a five-game on-base streak. And during this on-base streak, I went and looked up the numbers, all his exit velocities, and how hard he's hitting the baseball. And it's been getting harder every single day, and that's what she said. Uh, but on Sunday, here is some of his at-bats. He hit the ball 77 miles an hour, 82, 82, uh... 82-mile-an-hour double left field, hit the ball 94 miles an hour and 373 feet. Pretty hard on that one. On that day, he also had a walk on Monday where he reached base, an 80-mile-an-hour single, um, popped up, single, or 80-mile-an-hour 80, 80 ground out, 61-mile-an-hour single, and he reached on an error that he hit 94 miles an hour. So, again, the velocity is increasing. Then we go to Tuesday, 86, 99. 99 miles an hour fly out to left field, just 260 feet. He got under that one a little bit, but he hit it hard. Again, it had up, happened to go straight up in the air, but he worked a walk, then he struck out on a slider, then he hit the ball 90 miles an hour again. So it's increasing. Then we go to Wednesday, 91. 191 uh, fly out to left field, 355 feet. Very close. That one I thought might be a home run off the bat. Then he follows it up with three singles to center field, all hit pretty darn hard. 102 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, um, and then 85 miles an hour. All those straight up the middle, absolutely lining it on Wednesday. And then in yesterday's game, he had a 67 mile an hour fly out to second base. The double he hit 98 miles an hour. Um, on a changeup low and away, really, really nice piece of hitting there. Um, then 73 miles an hour and 59 miles an hour. So he's hitting the balls hard. He's hitting them harder than he was. There are some signs that he is improving. His plate appearances look nice. And even though he's chasing a little bit more, he's not striking out that much more. I'm not really sure how he's doing that when he's expanding the zone a little bit more and swinging, missing at pitches out of the zone more, that he's not, he's actually striking out less now. I don't really know. But again, we just saw it with Cole Calhoun, or we've been seeing it for the last couple of weeks, that it took a while for these new hitting coaches to get a feel for them. Their, their plans, their game plans for these guys are extremely specialized, individualized for the individual hitter. And they haven't had a whole lot of time to be with these hitters. Sure, they've done their advanced scouting, like during the lockout, I'm sure they, you know, looked at every single at bat and... I'm not the best scout to evaluate and see if his batting stance or um, approach or anything like that specifically in his swing is different than it was last year or in 2019 when he was amazing again. But <clears throat> I haven't seen anything that looks you know too incredibly different than what he was doing then. But again, it takes these hitting coaches a while to get to know these guys as people, as players what they like, what they don't like, how to best deliver them information. Some guys, they want to know everything. They want to look at every single you know, pitch, every, every single swing that they've taken in the major leagues and analyze the crap out of it. Other guys are just like, I want to see ball, hit ball. That's all, that's all I want to do. I mean, Yogi Berra said you can't think and hit at the same time. And other guys are just incredibly intellectual. And, you know, to each their own. Whatever works for you works. And Marcus Simeon has been in the big leagues for a long time now, so he know he knows what works for him at this point. He's had a 10-year big league career. 
That's 10 years. The guy knows how to be a successful big leaguer. We just showed it last year. He was absolutely incredible. And that's why the Rangers paid him all this money and it made him their first guy that they went to go get. Actually, John Gray might have been a little before him. or Maybe Cole Calhoun. But he was the first big guy of their two big guys. And he landing him was the key to landing Corey Seager, who is not going to just go here on an island and be the only good player on a really crap team. Simeon is important to this team and to their future, and he is just too hard a worker. He has too long of a track record that of a guy who just keeps getting better and better and better. Right now, he has a zero war, and I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the year, he ends up with a five war season. The guy is dynamite. He is an incredibly dynamic and great player, and he is just too good to be this bad for this long. I really encouraged by what I'm seeing. Honestly, once he hits that first home run, I think everything is going to just completely spark and he is going to look more like the guy the Rangers are paying all this money to and it's going to be worth every single penny. I'm still a little worried and I'm going to be keep being worried until he gets that first home run. Once that turns and once he starts to bring these numbers up, I mean, we saw how quickly Cole Calhoun fixed like his entire season's numbers after being significantly worse than Marcus Simeon in, in the first month of the season. Don't forget that Cole, Cole Calhoun was absolutely terrible in the first month and now is absolutely incredible. And his season numbers look like a respectable big leaguer at this point. So it really does. And it's only been two weeks basically for Cole Calhoun, like 15 games it took to turn it around. And so if Simeon, there, the signs are there. He's hitting the baseball harder. He's continuing to have these good approaches, and he is helping this team win in other ways. His defense is getting better. Because, again, even though he has fallen off quite a bit defensively from last year, this is still his only, only his second season playing second base every single day. So I am worried, and there is reason for concern, but I do believe that he's going to turn around. There is a small part of me that's worried because he had several seasons before where he was just kind of an average player in Oakland, like in, in 2016 and 17, even the, even the years before 2000, basically every year before 2019, he was just like eh, fine, pretty good player. I mean, he only had 20 home runs once in his career before 2019. He had a 27 homer season in 2016. Other than that, um, well, again, 2017, he was hurt for a lot of the season, only played in 85 games, only had 10 home runs then. But the season before when he was 27, the season before his big breakout year, he had an OPS of 706. He had an on base of 318 and slugged under 400 with 15 home runs and 35 doubles. So part of me thinks maybe, maybe he is just that player and he had a really great couple of years and he tricked people into thinking he was this great. But also, part of me thinks, no, no way. Marcus Simeon has been too good for these last three years, even with that really bad 2020, um, which again, his OPS was under 700 that year, only had seven home runs, which is seven more than he's got right now. But that was in 53 games. So even then, he was still hitting home runs and he was hitting in Oakland. But I don't know. I think he'll figure it out. Maybe he he likes hitting it. Maybe he likes being at Globe Life Field too much. I, I I have no idea what the actual deal is, and that's been one of the more frustrating things. Is you know watching his at bats and not saying okay, well he just looks overmatched or okay this one thing is clearly different. Part of it was maybe the baseball is being dejuiced. Part of it was him putting too much on himself. But again, the signs are there for him breaking out, and he is too dang good a player to be this bad for this long. Hopefully, tonight, he can prove me to look even dumber than I, than Nathaniel Lowe did and hit his first home run into those stupid Crawford boxes and start another Rangers winning streak. Thank you all so much for listening this week. I'll be back on Monday to talk about this series, and hopefully Marcus Simeon continuing his long on-base streak for the whole weekend. We'll see how it goes, but either way, I'll be there. Now, for your second listen, go make it locked on MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, please call him Sully. He brings you his unique perspective on the major leagues, both past and present. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, and until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball.